Hello and welcome back to Identity Architects, the InfoSum podcast that spotlights pioneers in the media industry that are changing the way that data is used to power better customer experiences. I'm your host, Ben Chiquetti, and for this episode, Marion DeCan from our customer success team sits down with Chris Andrews, head of marketing technology at Wake the Bear, to discuss privacy, first party data, measurement, and much, much more. Before we jump into that conversation, just a reminder to hit that subscribe button so you know when the latest episodes of Identity Architect land. But without any further delay, here's Marion's chat with Chris. Welcome back to Identity Architect. Uh, my name is Marion Daquin and I will be your host today. I will be discussing with um, Chris Andrews today, uh, who I'm really excited to talk to. Um, and I think we can dive right in. Um, Chris, that would be amazing if you could introduce yourself and wake the bear, uh, the agency. Uh, who are you and what do you do there? Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Uh, so I'm Chris, obviously, and I head up uh, marketing technology here at Wake the Bear. We're a marketing communications agency, uh, communications agency who focus kind of on a lot, working with a lot of brands across the spectrum. Uh, we work predominantly with kind of brands who are working through kind of key periods of change, really. So they might be starting up, they're scaling up, or they're in kind of the middle of a shake up. They, they can't come to us to, for some of those different challenges, but all with very much a bias towards growth, kind of understanding, you know, understanding and navigating the kind of current environment. And that that's very much across everything. That's across the, you know, the full suite of marketing. So whether that's kind of brand communications, brand strategy, whether that's kind of right down to kind of media and operations and, and tech and stuff like that, uh, that's you know, where we focus. So a lot of interesting brands that we kind of work with. My role within that covers quite a fair amount of ground, actually. Um, I think probably the simplest way of articulating that is, you know, I sort of look to help all those clients, regardless of kind of what their stage is, um, kind of make their marketing better through the application of data, through the application of technology. Uh, that sort of helps to make sure they're kind of set up for success properly. Um, so, you know, that might be very different for a startup brand who's kind of just starting out and going, well, actually, help me, guys. I've, I've just started this business. I've got this really great product idea. I've got this really great kind of notion, but I want to get out to market. What do I need to learn about my you know, my customers, my product market orientation? You know, how, how do I kind of scale that to this particular point? Through maybe to the scale-up brands, you might you know, be thinking about, um, you know, actually, I've, I've done a lot of stuff here. I've grown really well through the application of you know, social channels, YouTube and so forth, Google. Um, but actually, I need to take that next step. How are you going to help me with that? And then actually kind of finally through to, 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 to the sort of shake up brands and go, look, we've been working for a while. Things aren't maybe going as well as they could be. Or actually, we're ready to take the real next step kind of beyond that, which is taking that funding. Uh, and they all have kind of different challenges um, around that. So. It's really interesting to work with them and understand those different kind of areas, um, you know, help them navigate the kind of current landscape, whether that's just start talking about what CRM they need, right through to see you know, like data clean rooms, work with you guys at InfoSum. So really kind of essentially getting to, pro- to that proper understanding, helping them visualize, orient their data um, and operationalize that a lot of the time. But obviously, crucially, despite sort of saying a lot of that, it, it, it's very much about making sure the answer is just not technology for technology's sake. Uh, I think obviously we all know that in the industry there's a lot of aspect of that which can just end up being you know pure numbers pure tech and just layering on layering on layering on which kind of causes you know more problems as well sometimes um so that's us with the bear and myself within that um my my background generally is predominantly on the agency side and um, so i've worked sort of you know uh, across a number of kind of network agencies and independent agencies over the last few years in the independent side of things um i've also worked kind of did a bit of product management worked at accenture for a little while um and I think that's kind of given me a really nice background across across the industry um, to sort of understand a lot of different challenges, working with some advertisers who have barely come out of sort of um, stealth right up to big global advertisers who were looking about, you know, two points on their media sort of thing. So so it's, it's really kind of getting some of those ideas and understanding about how it is. And I think that gives a good reflection of kind of, you know, what, what's required, what's necessary. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's certainly an interesting part of the world. It is, uh, and I'm super excited to dive deeper into that into the second part of the podcast. But um, to start off, I'd love to dive in some rapid fire questions, uh, which is a nice little exercise we like to to start with. Uh, and actually, given that you've got a pretty good knowledge of the industry and like a lot of like um, different jobs that you had into industry, I'm curious to hear what's your earliest memory of of advertising. So my first memory of advertising, I suppose. The sense of 
the first very first kind of memories of it as a child uh, there's probably things like you know some of those pest of power kids adverts that you see i'm sure i don't know if i'm dating myself as too young too old or, or whatever sense but i think it's that mr frosty <laughs> snowman is like an ice you maker which i remember being on like must have been citv back in the day um but there's also kind of um like the jbc on the front of the arsenal kit that i used to wear that used to sort of covers as a child um probably though thinking about it it's probably like tobacco ads things like hamlet lambert and butler um probably says a little bit about why they're banned now uh the fact that i can yeah. remember them a number of years on um but yeah they're, they're probably the ones that stand out yeah that's so funny i think yeah cereals or anything like that brings you back to your childhood memory are always Definitely. the one that's stuck uh in your head <laughs> the honey ones um, and the sugar puffs so. Yeah. <laughs> what? Um, so you've talked a little bit about your your background. What was actually your your first job um, in advertising or, or marketing? So my very first job was a fairly standard agency role. Actually, I was a digital account exec. Uh, what was then MPG Media Contacts, now Habas um, in the UK. Uh, that kind of covered pretty much everything that was to cover at that particular point in time. Really, it was very focused on. Um, You know, ad ops, planning, buying, client servicing, a lot of time in the pub on Thursday night. You know, it was all, all kind of aspects of the industry. So it was a really nice grounding, um, which was obviously you know, a lot of hard work, but I think that kind of sets you up quite nicely for, for covering a lot of bases and, and going one way and uh, finding your path. Yeah, of course. And so based on what you learned from that experience and knowing what you know now, uh, what would you say to yourself when you started your career? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think... I would say it's either don't specialize too early or generalize too late. So it's one of the kind of two, but I think the more and more I sort of dwell on that and, and think on that, it's like, I'm not sure whether that's the right balance between the two, whether that's the correct order. But I think, I think it's when you find the right point that actually go, this is the point specialize, this is the point generalize. And I think always striking the right amount of balance of the two. Um, I hate the phrase T-shaped. Um, I, I get it. I hate it. But it, it's well back one of those kind of things is actually, you know, making sure you are, you know, you have a, a nice broad level of knowledge, um, but, but, you know, are sufficiently skilled in certain areas to, to really become an expert. Yeah, and it's and it's so hard to be like very hard on ourselves, right? When we start our career and sort of like, I want to see everything and learn about everything, but also I need to choose something eventually. Um, And within your role now, and obviously the industry that, that the industry, sorry, that we're in, uh, what do you love about it? And what do you love about what you do right now, your role and the industry? Yeah, I think it's um, in the good times, um, particularly obviously there's, there's lots of variety, lots of change, but in the good times, I think there's the sort of time and the energy that you're able to kind of spend thinking about things. I think we're all very kind of lucky, much as kind of complain sometimes, we're all very lucky to work in an industry where you actually spending a lot of time answering quite complex questions and actually engaging with, you know, some, some very challenging sort of discussions might not necessarily be you know, changing the world all the time, but actually it's one of those things where you can actually, you know, invest some time, invest some energy, thinking about how you solve particular commercial challenges. Uh, they, they can stretch you intellectually. And I think often you have to sift through a lot of nonsense there. Uh, you have to think of a lot of chaos sometimes, but actually being able to kind of react and respond to that and, you know, deliver the right kind of answers and especially, in the current line of work in terms of where we are awake working with a lot of clients who you know are at early stages they might be founders they might be ceos cmos who are so tightly invested emotionally financially everything in their business being able to kind of go back and deliver your kind of thinking that helps them along that journey and, and helps them kind of grow that is really rewarding and really exciting Yeah, that uh, makes me think, going back to your uh, answer on the previous question, I've always wanted to, I've always been curious to like the world of agencies and, and what happens in it, because I feel like you're touching on like so many topics at the same time, working across different clients, and that gives you a really nice spectrum of what are the different possibilities, clients that are at different stage. Um, so I may do a day in the life one day, who knows? Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think there's... There's so much stuff that you like say one day you're sort of it's fmcg the next day it's dtc it's yeah. b2b and not even the next day it's the next hour you, know, you have to switch yourself yeah. kind of mentally intellectually from from one to the other and you know and still maintain the same level and you know that level of kind of knowledge and integrity and it's so it can be exhausting but it's it's also kind of fascinating to you know like i say i obviously joke with my team and you know agency that i wear about I don't know how many hats I wear. I should be able to calculate them. I should have some kind of methodology or dashboard or whatever to calculate the number of hats that I've got. But, you know, but it, you know, it's, it's all about kind of wearing at the right time, but borrowing from the right kind of different things. And I think it's, it's really interesting to, to kind of keep that, 
hit that level yeah. of inside game. I like the analogy of the octopus because you're kind of like the center of, of contact with like so many legs and hands and trying yeah. to be, yeah, the center of everything. Absolutely, yeah. Help your clients. Um, so that actually leads me to, to my next question, which is uh, what keeps you awake at, at night, if there's anything? Um, I'll say we'll probably talk about sort of the economy or geopolitics or war or whatever. That's probably a bit too heavy an answer uh, for this. So I think in my sort of general life, I'd say it's probably... Um, kind of where we are calling now, whether Arsenal could have won the league, whether we hadn't drawn with West Ham and Southampton, where we'd be right now, would I still be on that hangover for the weekend? I don't know, but that's probably the thing that, you know, uh, that keeps me awake right now. Very frustrating. That sounds, uh, yeah, not the worst one to worry about. Not the worst one. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. And everything's, everything's okay right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what gets you motivated in the morning? Um, I mean, should Kill me if I didn't say it. Kill me if I didn't say it. Um, um, spending time with my wife Emma, obviously. Uh, she'll probably roll her eyes at me saying that, but you know, it's really good. Um, but like I said, probably in a work sense, it's probably um, being motivated by kind of that intellectual challenge and that stimulation. Um, if, you know, if you are spending your time solving problems, digesting problems, getting to the root of things, spending time unpicking why something's happening rather than just make like you know, pushing around things that make it happen. Those are definitely more kind of stimulating, motivating the days where you're just kind of going in and, you know, pushing around emails and facilitating, like, that's absolutely vital. But it, it, it's the kind of thing where actually it's like, well, actually, I'd love to be getting stuck into a thorny problem and going, here's how we've resolved that. Um, that's definitely much more motivating, for sure. Yeah, and definitely rewarding at the end of the day. Um I wanted to ask you as well about the, the concept of identity. Um, that's something we're obsessed about within ad advertising, the ability to identify individuals across devices and platform. And I'm very curious to hear from you how you would explain the term identity to a 10 year old, or I like the analogy as well of like speaking to your grandma, um, but yeah. we'll stick to the 10 year old. Uh, I've regularly tried to explain my job to my granny who is uh it's 97th birthday coming up in a couple of months Ooh, so uh, wow. she, uh, she has listened to me trying to explain to like, ask us again and again um i'm obviously probably coming across and will come across and not known for my brevity so trying to sort of summarize it for a 10 year old or a 97 year old is, is quite a challenge um but so i'm having a bit of practice explaining to the muse family members i'd probably go it's like the digital version of you essentially in, in that my sort of summarized sense um which either is going to make me sound like a massive boomer or it's going to make me steer dangerous close sort of metaverse territory, uh, not either of those, hopefully. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's very much around, you know, how do we identify certain aspects? Um, it doesn't have to be all of it. It doesn't have to be comprehensive. It doesn't have to be some kind of avatar, but it has to be an understanding of, you know, how, how do you engage with the world online in, in which, whichever way and, and what's that digital representation of self? And what do you take? How are you, how are you seen online? Yeah, I love that. Um, and last question from that rapid fire um, part, which is actually my favorite one. If there was a song that was a soundtrack to your life, what would it be? Um, that's a good one. I thought on this one. Um, four. I think because I'm a sort of middle class white male, I'm between the age of 25 to 44, thinning hair, a few thick over shirts, which is good kind of, you know, audience profile. I think it's probably going to be something by the National Bon Iver, obviously like both like those. Um, so it's probably like if you imagine the soundtrack to what's quite like a fairly well-received indie film, maybe like a Cannes film, uh, nothing much really happens. The main character's wandering around looking quite puzzled a lot of the time, but it's that kind of soundtrack. It, it, it's that kind of scene where he's probably, you know, cooking something or whatever. <laughs> um, that, that that kind of like low mellow guitar music, which doesn't really mean anything. I can picture it pretty well, though. It sounds like there a, we go. A, vi a video clip is happening in front of me. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, great Wonderful. storyteller. <laughs> Thank you for all those answers. So obviously, we've been um, working together quite a lot in the past uh, month. Um, really appreciate all of your knowledge in the industry and expertise, and I'm very excited to dive into deeper question around the industry, around first party data, um, and to get your view and uh, thoughts on, on the topic. So um, obviously, as you were saying, like first party data is part of the marketing strategies and part of the conversations with, between advertisers and media owners currently. Um, what is something that you would recommend every advertiser or media owner does now to prepare for the future? 
yeah, I think it's that, that's it's obviously a fascinating and completely open-ended topic in a way um, in terms of kind of how we want to get to it. But I think um, I think speaking sort of drawing on my experience of the last sort of four years at the Way the Bear uh, and all the challenges we've sort of seen across there, you know, we've worked with the likes of NatWest Group, for example, we've worked with Thoughtful, we've worked with Simba, we've worked with lots of different brands over that period of time, all with lots of different challenges. So actually, if you're talking, you know, again, back to that kind of framework of start, scale, shake sort of thing, if you're talking to startups, it, you know, the, the question is fundamentally the same, but actually for them, it's, well, actually, what do I need to, you know, I'm starting from scratch. What do I need to do? Like, what do I need to collect? What does this actually mean to me? I've got, I'm a CEO, I'm a founder, I'm, I'm doing the marketing role, I'm doing the finance role, I'm doing the operations role, I'm trying to build out this team, all this kind of stuff. What do I actually need to know about it? And it's the same sort of fundamental there when you think about like the scale ups and actually, well, I've got a bit of stuff. I've, I've had a great success in terms of my initial bit. I've got all that kind of like, value of death phase I've got out of that thing and I'm, I'm, I'm growing but is the addressable market that I've spoken to before the same as the addressable market that I need to do now and then I'll do all the way to that sort of shake-up thing well, actually do I have it right do I have you know the, the right kind of tools in place and that's so very important but I think what I'd say to all of those different kind of you know whether they're kind of whatever stage of that like growth they're at it's it actually comes back to the fundamental it's just actually structure it collect it in the right way because I think having the right strategy off the bat is the kind of thing that's actually going to help you collect the right information. It's going to help you get the right knowledge. I think what you need to do is, as long as you can kind of ask the right questions in the first place, you can understand the motivations, that's going to really frame about how you're doing it. Because actually, if they're then thinking about a really strategic approach to how you collect the data, that's going to help how you structure your team in the future. It means the tools you're going to get, the processes you need to put in place, how you're going to store it, how you're going to query it, all that kind of boring functional stuff, which is really, really important and keeps your CTO up at night. It's those kind of things that actually, you know, if you can kind of understand why you're using it, why you want to have it, what you need first party data for, then that's really valuable. And I think if you're thinking about it with the right motivations and you're thinking, I want to understand my customer and I want it to have an understanding of them to influence and inform my business rather than just influence and inform my marketing strategy, it takes it from being quite transactional on the marketing side of things to actually being this is fundamental for the rest of the business if we know about our customer we're going to know about our product we're going to know about our you know where we are in the market we're going to know about our competitor set for example where we are against that you know you get a lot of um, and it happens everywhere you know it doesn't happen I'm saying it happens to any particular client or any particular stage of life but you get to the point where you go well i know my customer is x or i think my customer is x but i don't know how many of them i have so actually if you're not able to kind of understand if you've actually done that collection up front and you've done that strategy up front and you've done that thinking up front then you're right back at that kind of stage where you can go, well, I know who they are, I know who I think they are, and if that changes a little bit later in time, I can I could be compl- I could be happy that I've got those people, and I can be happy that I can query that. You've got you've got it as granular as you need to, without necessarily going to the unnecessary, you know, view of kind of over collection of you know they've got their garden faces this way, and you know, when the moon's in this phase, they think about this. Like it, it, it doesn't need to go to that level of granularity. But if you have the right level of information, it's much easier to turn that into valuable knowledge. 100%. Yeah, and I feel like it, it creates that um, snowball effect of one fit the other one, basically. And, and you sort of like start with an assessment and, that, and then build over time uh, with what you learned and, and the different use cases you can put in place. Um, so that's very, that's very interesting. Um, what, in your opinion, so you talked a little bit about like the different uh, roles and, and people involved in that. Who do you think, uh, and obviously I'm talking about people, but more broadly, different stakeholders, uh, media owners, data partners, uh, or brands, who do you think is responsible for rebuilding that foundation of digital advertising for a better future? And I know you talked a little bit about, about it already, but how do you think can it be done? Um, and yeah, who would be responsible for that? Um, the short answer to that is obviously about the better future um, being a kind of product of quite a lot of things. And that's that's the rest of the fundamental part of the question is, is around the better future. And I think personally, there, there's two fundamental elements to that. There's the sustainability of the side of things on, on the one aspect, which I think is the most fundamental long term economically for every, every particular reason. But also privacy uh, and, and how we as an industry kind of engage with, with customers, because ultimately the industry is absolutely nothing without the people who are buying the products. And that's what we want to get to. Um, but everyone, I think, is collectively responsible for that in, in the short term. So I think everyone within the industry is a stakeholder uh, and everyone has to kind of understand, comprehend their role within that and has to kind of go, you know, respect the trade-offs that we need to kind of make. Um, so I think where we are is is the value exchange is, is the value exchange is so skewed and, you know, where, where we kind of 
get to is sort of working in this kind of very hyper extractive hyper capitalism sort of view of things where it's about consumption it's about competition it's about you know growth at all costs and you know actually is it about putting out two million three million four million impressions a day and just delivering loads actually can we be can we deliver more with kind of fewer better ads in that respect but also i mean equally we're kind of talking about the kind of different profile of clients that we work with and it's not necessarily true for one or the other and um, you know, whether it's large whether it's small whoever that might be but you know there's there's various different aspects of that who have different priorities you know i was reading some some stuff in the exchange where i think it was nano interactive did some research um and talking about kind of brands with budgets over a million pounds a year um they sort of see cookie decline they see privacy and they see green credentials as the absolute number one priority which is, is really important but for those kind of under a million pounds who might be in that sort of scale up or startup space actually for them that's fifth and sixth there's there's more about kind of growth and influence and marketing and some of the more tactical prosaic short-term things that, that are kind of focusing so you know that is kind of where we get to with that and i think there's always going to be trade-offs and there's always going to be things we don't want to kind of shut off certain markets but there will always there's always going to be a market for the easy over the good and because there's always going to be that market for the easy over the good there's always going to be a way of going well i'm just going to buy that lowest tier imagery i'm going to buy that i'm going to pump that out and kind of try and grow that way whereas actually you know, if there's things we can do to reduce consumption, there's things we can do to be more respectful of privacy and things we can be, you know, that actually prioritizes good quality content, good quality ads, good quality environments that actually ensures that publishers are able to make money, tech partners are able to get make money, enabling that to ensure that advertisers ultimately are getting, um, you know, are getting their message in front of customers and customers are getting a good internet. No one wants to be kind of going onto a website and getting 20, bombarded with 20 different repeating non-viewable ads or whatnot. Getting bombarded with non-view, but that's because I'm seeing them. But like getting bombarded with all those kind of different aspects, and, and actually, you know, that's kind of where that's important. So, I think if, as long as you recognise where that is for the system, look, it might sound sort of you know bleeding hard lefty, but that's kind of where it's coming from. Like actually, if we can start to just you know, refract some of that and, and think about where that can be involved, and think about the incentives that we put through the system and, and what we plan towards, I think that can give us a really kind of you know we can start towards engineering towards a system that might kind of think about that. Um, I think there's a really good, I mean, really good example. Um, a good friend of mine uh, works at WRA, and uh, he's sort of talking about, you know, he showed me some of the research and obviously public you know, public research, sort of talking about how, um, you know, I don't know if you know their operating model. Their operating model is essentially fewer better ads. That's what it is. It's it's you watch ads, you are rewarded for it as a customer. You can put that money back into, you know, back into your wallet. You can give that money to charity. All of it is, you know, intended to be low, you know, it's meant to be low emission, it's supposed to be low, you know, low impact sort of thing, but, you know, high impact in terms of performance. And there's the research they've done with Lumen, they've done with Scope 3 from the attention side of things, they've done it also from the um, from sustainability side of things. And actually, you know, it's lower carbon media and it's, it's working more effectively, it's having much more resonance. So it's not necessarily built entirely on, it's not built at all on, on extractive personal information, all that kind of stuff. It's actually built on serving relevant messages to relevant people. But not necessarily a total tiny, tiny micro granular way. Um, but the results are the results as you link are absolutely astonishing. You know, so actually there are ways that it can be done, and, and obviously if that can be scaled, and you know maybe that's the theory that can potentially be scaled. And then we talk a lot about IDs, and we talk about fledge, and we talk about uh, protected audience APIs or whatever we're calling it these days. Well, actually, there's validity in that if it can be kind of potentially scaled up. Um, but does it actually, you know, do we need to be at a point in order to go down all the Point of the theory on it but do we need to be a point where my personal data is leaving my browser does it need to be collated in that way or are there ways that actually that can be that can live elsewhere are there ways that actually the user can have more agency over what they share and, and invest themselves a little bit more in the value exchange not that most people care that much but actually if they're kind of if the right incentives are in place that, that kind of respects them i think we might be a bit more cognizant of how that kind of pulls through and I think once you again, uh, we talked about data collection earlier, talking about collecting the right incentives as part of the value exchange, that's going to be really valuable in actually moving that better future because it is much more, you know, in resource boundaries, it's yeah, it's it's in compliance and privacy boundaries, and everyone benefits from that. I know that sounds quite utopian, quite idealistic, but, but I think there's definitely there's loads of and it's also makes it sound like there's not loads of good stuff that's going on within the industry to do that. I think it's gone right up the agenda. I think there's a real recognition from a huge portions of the industry that that's the way we need to go uh, and very cognizant of our role within that. So I think I think we're very positive about that for sure. Yeah, I agree with you. And I feel like as much as um, everybody can have a different agenda at the end of the day, 
we're all talking about growth, performance, um, but also caring about our customers. And uh, as a customer, and we are consumers ourselves as well, like we just want to have a good service, a good product, good ads, <laughs> and kind yeah. of like uh, being respected along the process as well. Um, and that actually leads me to my next questions around challenges in the industry. Obviously, we talked about um, some of them already, uh, like privacy, um, consumer awareness, of course, but what are some of the challenges you see as a result of all of these changes? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, if I think about where we were sort of five, 10 years ago, you think about what kind of can be done or in different markets and, and how things are advertised. I think there's been some, obviously, as we all know, fundamental changes, and there's been attempts to kind of do BAU uh, alongside that. And I think the GDPR kind of came along um, it obviously changed the game a little bit obviously iOS 14.5 and kind of, kind of came along and changed the game there as well we think what's kind of come off the back of that and especially again talking about cookie deprecation whether it happens next year year after whenever that happens we never know um whenever that kind of does come to pass actually the collaboration the kind of interoperability the mutual benefit that we're kind of talking about that, that there's a recognition and actually the fact that a lot of the challenges to you know, Google kind of withdrawing that has actually been around competition, it's been around actually fair access to the market and not monopolizing things. And, and that's, I think, really kind of valuable is there, there are ways of you know, working in dialogue, working in collaboration. It's a very collaborative industry, right? It, it relies on cooperation to work. So I think um, that will continue, I think. Um, but I think there are obviously challenges to that. Again, we've talked plenty about, you know, different kind of models actually. Are we trying to do BAU? Are we still trying to kind of replicate that? You think about things like Vice, for example, BuzzFeed, Lane, kind of journalists often go by with bankruptcy. Is that kind of sustainable? Is there a long tail of publishers that can, can be sustained? Like we obviously want to have that. We want to have media clarity. We want to have various different conversations. We don't want to kind of shutter things off. So again, we talk about, you know, that there is a need to kind of shift towards ID and there's a need to shift towards registration, but does that kind of stratify? Does that create a two tier, three tier, four, five tier internet, which actually doesn't necessarily kind of do that can we deliver that can we deliver basically an economic within the industry that the, the kind of services that but also i mean probably a critique of a lot of the stuff i've talked about is people will say well look, if you're saying this you're probably you know strapped by the market you'll shut people out you don't want people paying for subscriptions and having you know the best you know the best news being behind the paywall and just crap news being you know free and an open sort of source sort of thing actually maybe that's a bad thing obviously it's just quite a lot of fundamental shift to the economics of it um because then again, there's things about concentration. It's like, are you giving too much power to the big tech companies? If you're talking about in browser, in device, are you again continuing to monopolize that? But I think there's there's such a sort of spirit of innovation and understanding that I think there are opportunities to think about, you know, how, how can we do that? But fundamentally, when we, when we take it all back to, again, any class we work with, any conversations we have, any of us have at any point of it, um, is, is fundamentally, how do we compel, you know, people to buy things, not necessarily compel, is how do you encourage people to buy things? Um, you know, how do we actually get people to, how do how advertisers can sell their products in a way that's not really pushy or anything like that and, and selling products they believe are going to improve people's lives and, and continue that kind of in engineering growth. So it's, it's a lot of challenge, I think, because obviously, yeah, a lot of competition, um, you know, if, if you have those fewer better ads, does that shut out smaller companies? Does that price them out of growth? You know, can, if I'm a major advertiser, if there's a more stratified controlled market, can I just completely price it out? Um, but again, people can access television, people can buy television and, you know, and deliver growth in that way. Um, I don't think necessarily having that regulation, that, that level of limitation. And if you then say defending the however many, the 30% by default ads that aren't viewable, for example, or, you know, don't, don't deliver any effect, they're not defensible in that way. You know, if, if they're not being seen, not being served and that, that standard's not being met, then, that's actually a way maybe you can reduce consumption, even if that does drive the unit costs up in, in a slightly different way. So it's, it's, it's a challenge really, but lots lots to pick on. But I think, like I say, that spirit of collaboration, that spirit of innovation is, is certainly something that can that can respond and, and, and meet those challenges. 100%. And um, going into that collaboration topic, uh, and obviously first party data may be involved in this one, um, what are some best practices you would give or, or share any learnings that you 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 have uh given the past experiences you had recently with brands uh when starting their first party data strategy or just a data collaboration journey in general yeah um i think the most important thing as sort of touched on earlier is very much around that structuring collection 
hammering in the right way. I think, if, like I say, if you've got that strategic approach, um, you know, and know why you're collecting it, know why you want to use it, then if that's kind of been informed by that upfront, then actually that answer becomes very easy. You go, well, actually, it's just an extension of that. We want to reach this many more people. We want to reach this many more customers. These are our priority customers. These are our most loyal. These are our least loyal. We want to find more of the most loyal. We want to find more of the new customers, you know, left the returning customers. How are we going to then kind of potentially acquire those and, and, and have that conversation? So I think very much around, you know, knowing the parameters that you want to collect, knowing what's, you know, for you as a business. Again, back to that startup, actually, you, you've done a bit of work probably on your, on your, you know, your product. So you're probably really, really passionate about that product. You probably know some of your core customers. What do you want to know about them that's going to help you find more of them? Or actually, what's the, the other habits and what's the other piece of things that you might want to learn about them? If you're, you know, an FMCG, for example, you're not going to get as much value out of that data in the way that a B2B SaaS or an e-commerce retailer is. So if you're, if you're thinking about that kind of collection in the first place, do you need to put your eggs in that basket? Do you need to go down that road or do you actually need to think kind of elsewhere? Um, Again, talking about scale ups, like a lot of the uh, a lot of the work we do, and it's probably where the, the predominant areas of this kind of growth in this first party data collection kind of comes in. Is we need to grow. We we you know we need to take that next step. Um, and, and the best brands we've worked with are the ones that definitely have been very conscious about that collection of that process. Have been very conscious about their privacy permissions, that what they're going to use it for where they're going to load it in. They've got the right CRM tools. They've got teams that staff to do that. They've got great data science teams who know how to interrogate that data, who know what they're looking for out of that. And they can they can work hand in glove with marketing. You've got great marketing teams who then sit alongside them and know the questions to ask. Um, again, we'll talk, you know, talk a lot about, you know, prompts and generative AI and all that stuff. Well, actually, so much of it is the art of asking the right question. And I think if everyone is, is sold in on the process and everyone's sold in on what they know, what's valuable to them, um, then that's obviously becomes, you know, becomes becomes a lot easier because then you have that that embedded throughout the business rather than it just being a process there. And I think this is very true again of, of, of the, the shakeups and rounds we sort of talk about there is they're obviously potentially generally much bigger organizations or organizations that are kind of adapting to, to, to business change or you know changing headwinds, changing economic conditions. And actually so much of that is that is true as well. It's but actually it's still answering the same fundamental question is like, what do you want to learn from this? Uh, and, and how are you going to apply it, not just in the marketing context, but also across the business? 100%. And I, and I guess, um, so it all, all goes back to, to performance at the end of the day. And I guess uh, measurement is a big part of it, isn't it? Um, how do you think measurement is going to change um, in a world without cookies? I think there's, yeah, so much to it. I mean, again, it depends on what you're measuring. Um, I think, if again, to that point, if you're asking the right business questions and you're asking about the right outcomes, um, then that's that's a huge step. Um, again, we've been lucky to, to, to work with a lot of clients who, who might not necessarily have relied on cookies. They might not have necessarily relied on that expectation of one-to-one. -one. They might have looked through and actually gone, you know, a lot, I think a lot of advertisers, not speaking for our client base, but for advertisers more generally, they've kind of looked at this and gone, well, Apple's taken away the IDFA, cookies are going to go away. There's the, the, these whole kind of changes that I think a lot of companies, advertisers, and just throughout the ecosystem are a lot more familiar with right now. So we're definitely on that, that step. But I think a lot of the, the clients kind of emerging and growing successfully, particularly out of COVID and beyond that, very much recognize that the one-to-one -one view of cookies um, and the one-to-one -one view that kind of potentially enabled isn't necessarily aren't helping them answer their business questions. Actually, a lot of what they're interested in is going, well, actually, before you tell me what that's doing and someone saw that and took that action off the back of it on a one-to-one -one basis. Tell me a lot more about, you know, what's that doing? How, how many how many of these products have I sold? How many policies have I sold? How many accounts have been opened as a result of that? And taking it right back to the business measure. And if you go, you've got one thing on one side and you've got one outcome on the other, actually then trying to find the relationship between that. If, again, if you strategize that correctly, what you're then going to be able to do is model for that, you're going to potentially think about econometrics, you're going to think about econometrics light even, or you're thinking about MMM. So it gives you options towards you know, understanding that path. And it's not necessarily talking about multi-touch attribution, that does definitely lead down that path. Um, but I think what, what, what we'll then kind of end up kind of going towards is, yeah, is changing the modeling, is model conversions rather than, um, and model conversions rather than sort of specifically one-to-one um, -one or you know, track there. But again, you want to make sure you, you're accounting for 100% of the, you know, 100% of the actions, 100% of the, the, you know, the conversions that you're selling um, or conversions that you're delivering from products that you're selling. 
then I'll treat that kind of nets back through. Um, if you've not got that expectation in the first place, you're much more likely to sort of see that as, as a valuable way of doing things. So actually you then end up on that econometrics path. It makes it much less worrying to kind of go down that road. It makes it much more manageable. And therefore the kind of familiarity with that and knowing that you know some of your conversions in Meta are modeled, some of your conversions in Google, Snapchat, TikTok, they're all kind of modeled on that basis. So that builds that encouragement. I think, again, with the kind of development of AI, which has already obviously been embedded, we're talking about it socially and we're talking about economically much more, but it's obviously been embedded in a lot of what, what you know, ad tech and, and MarTech has is, is been over the last few years anyway, so a lot of it is embedded. I think that will just continue to grow and iterate. And I think um, that will build, while there will be elements that will, that will worry, that will also build confidence in we're actually going, there are gaps here and we understand what we don't know. Um, so we're shifting from that kind of cognitive view of like, I need to know absolutely everything. I need to account for absolutely everything. Go, actually, here are the things I don't know. Here are the gaps there might be. And here's what I'm filling that with. Here's the assumptions. Is everyone in the business? Is everyone culturally clear on what those are? If that's if that's the case, then I think that, that builds a lot of confidence and, and gives an opportunity. Obviously, we'd all love the one-stop shop of, yeah, I put this out there. I sold this many products. It happened because of this. But actually, there is, you know, there is a gray area. There's, there, there is that, that, that gap. And I think it's, it's on us to, to fill that with, what we think we know and what we think we can come to understand and you know look to fill in the gaps you know with, with, with what else might, might fill that yeah and, and i feel like um starting simple right as well like it's, yeah. it's easy to be to feel very overwhelmed and uh have all of these fancy goals and and uh use cases you want to achieve but at the end of the day if you want to actually achieve something you've got to start somewhere and build over time and to your point earlier assess what you have already and then build over time and and just um yeah yeah that's exactly Wait. it and i think yeah and i think that's obviously talking about you just need to know what you need to know like we, we've so so much kind of done around the measurement of like i if i can't measure this i'm not going to do it if i can't measure this big tv campaign i'm not going to do it it's like okay you don't get your big tv campaign you don't get your growth you don't get your fame you don't get everything there i just think there is a shift away from that that, that logic now and i think we're sort of seeing well actually i accept and i embrace what i don't know um but we're going to find out yeah the, the kind of solution obviously everyone's still accountable to roi everyone's still accountable to the next month the next quarter the next year everyone's still absolutely accountable to that i'm not saying sort of off some laissez-faire being like yeah it's great don't worry about it like it's yeah. still fundamentally important to be able to deliver success and most success but if we've got an understanding of what that is delivering beyond the one-to-one -one, that opens up a lot more kind of avenues for understanding the effectiveness and the impact of market marketing yeah 100 percent um and going back to your point about filling the gaps um and talking more about technologies is there any technology um emerging in this space at the moment that that are exciting you or or things that are missing but you think would be great to have yeah i think i mean obviously pertinent given the conversation given the forum we've got um obviously the work we've been doing you guys at info some the data clean room space is obviously absolutely fascinating it's been really really instructive over the last sort of period of time that we've been working together to, to properly understand that and i think it, it's such a it's such an intuitive um intuitive kind of use case and intuitive solution to that kind of a problem um which is to say well actually you know, we've got this first party data, we've collected this information, you know, completely consented, completely, you know, customers who are willing to, you know, engage with us, customers who are willing to understand that. And we want to understand them in a much, you know, completely compliant, completely privacy safe way. Um, so it's actually able to query that to link up with other partners in the industry to go, actually, here's, here's the information that I want to learn about my customers. Here's the information that you can tell me about your customers. Let's kind of connect those bits together. Um, completely secure, completely pro. I think it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And I think it's, We've had some sort of baby steps so far, um, but you know, the brand we're working with, obviously not necessarily one that you would necessarily straight off the bat say would be the typical data clean room use case, but actually, you know, we've been able to get some really kind of useful insight quite quickly out of it as well. Um, so, you know, we've done some work with Channel 4, for example, we've seen some incremental uplift on, on, on activity we've run. We're looking at some kind of, you know, profiling some insights, some of the brilliant kind of data partners as well. So. What that just opens up is, you know, great stuff across insight, it opens great stuff across, you know, activation and, and also, you know, potentially, hopefully in the future, can, you know, again, open up some commercial opportunities as well between the brands that are kind of in there. So it sounds like I'm sort of shilling, I'm definitely been paid for this, but it's, it's definitely one of those that we've kind of talked about. And I think we're definitely seeing huge amounts of value for, 
for us and for our clients as well is it's helping a lot it's helping a lot of interesting and intellectually stimulating conversations really which is, which is, which is brilliant um more generally i think obviously there's a load of stuff i've, I've talked uh, again sort of about sustainability and obviously a big kind of passion point of mine uh, i think that there's a lot of it's great that a lot of the supply side uh, sort of certainly in programmatic is making big steps towards that i think uh, a lot of agencies as well are doing some brilliant work too again um not a sort of tech company not a piece of tech but perhaps disruptors are doing some really cool stuff there as well in terms of changing some of the narrative there but i think from a tech perspective i think scope three are like absolutely fascinating there I think they've made all the kind of right noises in, in stimulating that conversation. I think that's come from a deep recognition of of what the challenges are, what the credibility needs to be within the C-suite as well. Uh, and I think because that kind of you know, because that's kind of coming out uh, and you know, giving that credibility, giving that kind of again we talked previously about kind of measurement and, and what that looks like. Actually, to be able to put a number on it a lot of the time is helping to motivate those things in the right direction. And obviously, that's going to sit very much at the uh, that kind of larger in enterprise brand end but again as I talked about earlier if we can start creating that market make that market for easy embed the market for the good within that i think there's some, some really valuable uh, notions that we can kind of draw out of that and then obviously you don't want to talk too much flavor of the month um, but obviously again we talked about sort of generative ai i'm not sure if that's exciting or terrifying um because it you know there, there's there's certain elements of it which are super exciting and again we've, we've seen the benefit of ai we've seen the benefit of, of machine learning within you know, within the industry anyway but actually the current state of play the fact that it's kind of come out economically come out socially sort of thing and it's hit the wider public consciousness you know it's obviously going to get embedded more and i think obviously more generally there's obviously guardrails that needs to be kind of built into that and, and not just deferring absolutely everything to the machine um which I think is obviously a, a, a much kind of bigger conversation. I think, you know, there'll be an element of regulation kind of required from that. So that's it's probably the bit that's missing. Um, again, obviously, sort of talk about measurement, you know, say there about, you know, MMM and, and, and being able to get a kind of real-time view of things. I think there are some some interesting players there. Obviously, we're, we're lucky to work with a really great data team. Again, wait there as well. You're actually able to kind of look at some of those things. So it doesn't always need to be a technological solution, um, but things that can enable that and, and push that along is, is really useful as well. Yeah, we talk a lot about technology, but at the end of the day, it's, it all starts with, with humans, right? Um, I mean, obviously, we talk about AI, which is more of a scary, sort of like uncontrollable <laughs> part of um, the technology right now, and that grows at a very exponential level. But um, essentially, all of the technologies that are being um, created and used right now all come from humans and used by them. So that's also exactly. great that we can yeah come back always come back to that human side of things and that collaboration um because yeah yeah that's, that's exactly yeah makes, makes total sense yeah i think um like i say it, it will probably be quite damaging for you know, some some jobs and i think actually then that is very much like you say there i think all philosophical but it's like it's, it's about how we maintain being human in that environment um, in that kind of thing actually what does it enable what does it help us do um but then also again Talk about environment being conscious of you know actually it's, it's just getting more raw computing power like actually let's just not race into it without without quite thinking about the long-term consequences for all the other factors that are, that are potentially worry yeah and and keeping keeping that um trust as well on a on a high level i guess which is a, a key part and definitely a, a big part out of it um what do you think are some of the things that should change and how can we as an industry come together and, and redefine our relationship with each other with each other to, to just what we, we just touched on yeah i think i think it's that again like i talked about earlier about being collaborative continuing that spirit of collaboration continuing that spirit of innovation honesty as well like i say is, is, is one of those key things and i know it sounds like a sort of business seminar but actually you know that kind of is about how you know trusting with people don't make stuff up like don't come to me with the stuff that's entirely fabricated no one wants to walk into a room and be like this campaign did amazingly and you've got a load of glum faces staring back at you saying well no it didn't like we, we completely missed the target what's wrong with you like and i think that's obviously a bit of a microcosm thankfully we don't have too many of those meetings they do happen but they don't have too many of those meetings um and no one wants to walk into them because actually you know what you want to do is, is make sure you've got the knowledge that's being spread around everyone um and actually if you're being collaborative no one's coming in being surprised so it's going to like a review meeting and being like oh i've just been given this feedback i expect that's a bit weird like if you if you've got that kind of collaboration being built in by design and you know you're working with with partners you work with your clients you work with tech partners you work with media partners 
actually if you've got that in the right kind of way and where information is properly surfaced it is able to be drawn on collaboratively um that helps to build trust um you know it's not talking like a blockchain whatever way or the you know some of the underlying principles if we go into the crypto the nft nonsense some underlying principles that might not might be working there but also it's kind of under un, kind of principles around kind of underpinning clean room tech as well um so obviously when you're sort of talking about we can all bring different levels of insight i can't necessarily share that ones and zeros with you but there's a way you can query that so let's how, how do we bring that to the table everyone's got an opinion that's valid everyone's got a perspective that's valid how do we bring that to the table um and if we can kind of facilitate that then that's obviously going to increase that which is which is brilliant and i think then that just means that everyone is able to you know bring something to the table from their perspective which can then enhance the thing once everyone's invested it's more collaborative it's more trusting and everyone's kind of invested in the process um but again, it's, I guess it's also setting that those right incentives as well. Obviously, some of the trust has probably fallen away over the last ten years, probably maybe, maybe a bit longer, has been around. Well, actually, verifying what I'm buying, you know, the whole down to things like initiatives like Aztec, Aztecs and so forth. Like, how can you verify what I'm buying? Uh, how can I break that trust? And I think that talks about what I sort of talked a little, about a little bit earlier around that kind of point around potentially scarcity. Do we need to create more scarcity in, in, in some respect so we can be a bit more sure of what we're buying? You know. We can't always collect every piece of information on, on potential customers because we don't want to. We don't want everyone to be collecting all the information on the readers. We want to be making the right decisions on things. So how can we actually build you know, more, more trust in what, what we're buying for advertisers on that buy side? Um, but then also from, from customer perspective, more importantly, um, no one likes being bombarded with ads. So, but so much of the economics of what we do compels it. So how can actually some of that building trust is just rewriting some of those and, and adjusting some of those economics because actually there's going to be some limitations on what we can do. If it's all about driving the price down the whole time, then that creates just an incentive to push that price down. And there's going to be some bad actors that might necessarily emerge from that. And actually, you know, it's not, there's a bit of realism built in there and that starts to you know, you disincentivize that and again. We'll talk, talk, talk about it a lot but creating the market for the good rather than just oh it's easy like i can, I can get out there i can buy that it's 50p cpm it will just deliver and i'll spend the money and i'll get my retainer off it and all that fun stuff actually it's it has to cost a little bit more but we're going to find the right people we're going to deliver it and it's going to deliver business outcomes which is going to keep things circling through and it's going to keep things growing you're going to sell more product we're going to you're going to use more of us as your services and the customer's going to get something they want to have and when you think about it, everybody is kind of like um, figuring it out. So everybody is trying, failing, learning from what they've been uh, doing. But at the end of the day, if we all keep um, authentic and just learn from each other and try to go somewhat on the same path together, um, you know, doing collaboration, that's going to help uh, building that trust and um, driving business at the end of the day as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, it was really great um, talking to you. I don't know if there is anything else that we haven't mentioned that you wanted to to add uh, before I ask you our last final question. No, I think that's, uh, like I say, covered a lot of ground. I think there's not, like I said, there's so much you potentially can sort of talk about and discuss and, let's say, for a short period of time. You've got these whole massive, fascinating questions which probably go on for, like, three four five hours but i don't think anyone wants to listen to that but but yeah it's, it's it's one of those fascinating ones so i think yeah great to great to chat and great to you know go deep on some of those topics is really yeah really interesting thank you it's a it's a broad uh, topic thank you and um this podcast is all about the individuals who have pioneered new ways to use data to deliver better customer experiences um is there Anyone, when thinking about the industry, uh, someone that you admire and you that you would like to nominate for us to interview? Uh, I'm going to embarrass my good friend Jake Wrigley. Uh, he is uh, he works as, as I mentioned earlier. He works at uh, We Are Eight. Uh, he's obviously got a load of background. We worked agencies together. He's done some load of great stuff at Capital. He's um, like I say, really really smart guy in terms of thinking about how he works different you know different aspects with different clients kind of growing things there but then going to kind of we are and, and focusing on you know working on their ad product and stuff like that uh, but doing so in, in a way that is looking to improve things and looking to improve you know make a better world from that um both in sort of an ad sense and that so i'm, I'm going to nominate and embarrass him and i'm going to tell him after this that i've done it um, he's going to love it <laughs> brilliant thank you so much chris uh awesome conversation and wishing you 
all the best and a good day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks again to Chris for joining us on Identity Architects. That was an awesome conversation and it was great to hear more about the brilliant work Wake the Bear is doing. All that leaves for me to do is to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until then, thanks for listening. Thank you.